Welcome to Catania the Movie. I wanted to thank my dad, Aunt Mary, Uncle John, Uncle Mike for the wonderful job they did in bringing their memories of their childhood and Grandma Katie, our beloved matriarch, to life. Great grandma, Lucrezia Russo, came over with her three children, three daughters, Rosa, Catherine, and Vinci, on the Dante Alighieri in 1917 with all of their possessions that they could take, I guess, in this steamer trunk. And uh, we didn't know it existed until my cousin John said, after Uncle John died, I have this and does anybody want it? So we were lucky enough to have it first and uh, my sister Vicki now has it and then it'll go down to the, whoever would like to have this little memory of a hundred year old trunk that came over from Sicily. And now we're six generations since uh, my great grandmother and my grandmother and Aunt Rosie, Aunt Vincy came over from Sicily on that boat in 1917, over a hundred years. When we get together, it's loud. Don't come here if it's soft, because <laughs> you're going to hear people talking a lot, and we're going to cover a lot of ground, because we only have this one day usually to get together, so we unload everything. <laughs> The reason for this gathering is that we establish who we are, what we are, where we came from, and what we've achieved in all these years. Grandma came here seven years old, not two nickels. They lived in a place which was behind the house in a barn upstairs, which was like a hayloft of a horse barn. <laughs> That's where they started. Grandpa, I'm not so sure about his starting, he came here after a year or so, he lived in Boston with Uncle Mike and came to Detroit. Uh, I think Uncle Mike was here and somehow he met Grandma and he was pursuing her. She would have nothing to do with him because he had to be properly induced, reduced, introduced. <laughs> I'll get it. <laughs> How you did all yet? I still got it. Well, there was three brothers, Joe, Mike, and my, our, my, my father, Neil. Uncle Joe stayed in Italy, raised 12 kids, and he stayed there and he probably did fishing. And Uncle Mike, he left Italy and he moved to Gloucester so he could fish, because that's all they knew, fishing, that's all they knew. When they came from the old country and they moved here, they found Grandpa Giovanni was already here. And so they all lived together with Grandpa Giovanni, Aunt Mincy, Aunt Rosie, Uncle, uh, Uncle uh, Grandma, Katie. And I think they had two boarders to help pay for the rent. Uh, my dad came about 1922. Uh, he and Uncle Mike lived in the uh, Lower East Side of Detroit, uh, probably on Russell Street or Monroe Street. Lower, very Lower East Side. That was a, a complete Italian community. Uncle Mike came first and my dad came second. He was a sanitation worker for the city of Detroit. Giovanni Russo died in that house when, at the year that Mike was born, 1934. He died in that house way in St. Albert. Well, that's where we were living at the time, I guess. And he died of Parkinson's disease. All the asylums had moved during the Depression. They all moved to California. Well, uh, my father had a set of tools. He was actually, uh, he knew a little bit about the concrete cement business because we had trowels in that at the house. And I know he did do some cement work for somebody, but he worked mostly at uh, Ford's in the foundry. He was always on, he was always fishing uh, on the East Coast. Most of the time he was there. Uh, he went to California briefly, but he was only there a couple of months and he didn't really have any success there, so he went back to Gloucester. I remember my father when I was about nine years old and he came back from fishing in Gloucester and to San Diego. He had friends there, a lot of friends. They were all fishermen. And they fished down there. Then when the when the North Atlantic opened up, you can get out there and make some big money. And he would send a lot of the money home. And then Grammy was we lived on Benson at that point and then uh, she could pay the rent. Uh, when he came back to Michigan, 
he, he would come back periodically, but he wouldn't stay very long. Uh, he had to be near the near the water. He, need, had, he had to be near the water. He couldn't be in land. He just felt claustrophobic if he wasn't, mm -hmm. because that's where he was brought up from the old country. So, uh, so he wasn't home very much. Grandpa went to uh, you know fishing, and we never saw him. But he used to come home now and then, and she'd bring, he used to bring us, one time he brought us a big Mexican sombrero, one time he brought us a donkey with uh, bags on the side, it was about chalk, you know, and it was beautiful. And uh, a few other things, you know, I, we don't, I don't remember. But he, uh, he tried to be somebody good, and he, he did the best he could. He was a strong, quiet person, but he had strong principles about honesty and integrity. I stayed out of his way. I, I never said much to him. He never said much to me, except he smoked and he called me, and I run to him, and then he just throw this cigarette in the in the toilet, and flush the toilet, because he wanted to bring a husband. So I used to come there and get it, and, and then I was threw it away, you know. But took <laughs> 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 Oh, man, I threw that thing away. I never did, I quit smoke. <laughs> 20 grand cigarettes, they call it 20 grand. It's a picture of a horse, the horse's name was 20 grand. <laughs> and, and at that time you could buy them for like two cents a pack. Remember all quite my father was on He was stern. Mm. He'd just look at you. He'd just look at you and say, Frank, sheep. Mm. He daily. John was the only one though. John was quiet man. You know, John was his, was he his pet. All right. was he he his liked pet? John, but oh. he, he teased Mike. He used to tease Grandma, Kate, uh, Nono, and uh, chase chase us with the broom and said, Those kids are bad, I'm going to get them. And Grandma protected us and she closed the door in the bedroom, Get under the bed, get under the bed. And she'd get a broom and she'd fight him back. And he'd get, Open up, I'm going to get those kids. And the more she, he did that, the more she got mad. <laughs> So she was, she was rumbling though, and she would knock that door and hit him out, and he'd back off. You know, he says, oh, "It's enough for now. I'd get, I'd get her, get her again some other time." But she, ne he never got her though. How did Dad meet you? What? Uh, how did this come to be? He lived upstairs from Aunt Rosie, her husband's house, Uncle Chris's house, and he was boarding upstairs and he saw me downstairs by my sister. And my sister then talked to my mother and my father, and that's the way it went along. So Arranged. How about the date? How did you guys date? What date? You didn't date then? Well, how did you talk to one another or visit At one another? At the dinner table with everybody around. We didn't have no talk. I was a kid, what you do you want? Did you get the whole hands or anything? What hands? <laughs> you think it's like today? <laughs> what hands? What did your father have to say about all of this? Well, he was the boss. And that went, and that's it. So I married. Yeah. And what did I know at 15 years old? What? When my father had come back from uh, California, he had failing health. He had a rheumatic heart from when he was a kid and because of the work he did as a fisherman and getting hot and cold it, at night of uh, being out on the ship out at sea, it exasperated his condition by the time he was about 38 or so. At that time he was in Gloucester and we lived in Detroit. He couldn't uh, go to any hospital because we didn't have insurance, he had social security, he didn't have anything. So he was able to go to the Siemens uh, Hospital in Detroit here on Alter Road. And he also was good in Massachusetts. He had the Siemens insurance in Massachusetts. Mm. So he went to Massachusetts with that illness and then and Grandma Katie went there for about a week. Uh, it was in the summertime. So he was taken there and then my mom went out there to be with him while he was ill in the hospital. We stayed at home. We lived on Benson at the time. My grandmother lived with us all the time. Anyway, so she was there to take to, to take care of us. So she went there, and uh, she was there with him for about a month and a half. 
in Boston, and then uh, they came back. Then a few weeks later, well, about a month later or so, uh, then he came home and he stayed on. It was an outpatient at uh, receiving a hospital. My mother and I went to visit him. She'd go every day and bring him spaghetti, chicken soup, and because he didn't eat the hospital food. I remember a fellow across the street there says your father had a hard time at night. One night, the night before I came there. So a few days later, then he, he passed away. I didn't, I didn't know him that well. Yeah. But I do remember him because he left an impression on me. The only thing I remember about my father dying, he, he died uh, on my sister Mary's birthday, December the 5th. And I was uh, shining shoes in a shoe shop, and uh, my brother John came down and got me. He says, well, Mom wants to see you. So I came uh, home, and I said, what's that? And my, John wouldn't tell me. And I got home, and, and my mouth broke up, and she told me. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was on a Saturday. Mm -hmm. It was my best day. <laughs> when he died, they had funerals, and then, and then them days where uh, they uh, had the body at, at the home. I do remember that his casket was in the living room for three days, and that was very kind of traumatic because we never had that happen before. We had the funeral right in the, our house on Benson, right oh to the window. And so all the people came, we had the flower outside, all people came, and Uncle Mike came from Gloucester. He was laid out for three days, and Grandma Katie never left the that room for the three days and she they tried to get her to eat and she would you know they feed her and all that and she was she was very depressed and on the the flowers was uh, the time they expired oh um, 9 30. Mm. i think the worst part of, the, of that was that um that i was only 11 and just to have a, a dead body in the house for three days is going to affect different people different ways. Mm -hmm. That plus the fact that my grandmother insisted that I wear black to go to school. All the other kids had fathers and I think that bothered me some that everybody else has a father. I don't have a father. Not that I really, mm -hmm. you know, emotionally missed his being there mm -hmm. because we just never had him there anyway. Mm -hmm. So I think I was a little bit ashamed to say my father was dead. Things really didn't change that much whether whether he was um, alive or after he passed away because he wasn't around that much anyhow. Mm -hmm. So my mom took over and well, she always raised us anyway, whether he was here or not. She was mother and father to all of us. So mm -hmm. um, it was her glue that kept us all connected. Grandma, a remarkable woman, lived to be 94, was the boss she was the unshakable Molly Brown, or whatever. Unsinkable Molly. <laughs> At any rate, she was, uh, she was a going concern. She kept us all in line. She'd take a broom and whack Uncle Frank with it if, when he stepped out of line when he was a teenager. And he just stood there and he knew he had it coming. She, she was tough. She, she ran a tight ship. You didn't step out of line and you get it. I got a, I got a crease right here. <laughs> She hit me with a frying pan, and uh, Uncle Mike got cut here because uh, he was ducking away from her, and she had it night, and she threw it at him and stuck him in the hand. <laughs> but she was a uh, she was stern, mm -hmm. but she was a uh, she was she was quiet when my father was home. One time, uh, the boys were pushing Cherise around, and she went to grab and said, "Grandma, the boys are pushing me around." She was about three years old. She said, "Well, smack them." She went back and she smacked them both. <laughs> they came back to Grandma Teresa crying, Goodies, they couldn't say Cherise, hit us and pushed us. She said, well, don't fool around with her then. <laughs> and we weren't in fear. My mother was strong. She was a very commanding, but at the same time, she was kind. We would walk to Belle Isle, believe it or not. 1940, carrying bushel and blankets and stuff all over. We carry everything there, walk all the way to the Canadian side and walk all the way back. Never mind the bus. And we got there. That was times then we were living on our own uh, away. We lived on Benson Avenue in, in Detroit. That's in Concord. And uh, we would walk. That was a couple of miles at least. 
Uh, I was always dragging tail. Aunt Mary would always look in back, crying, Oh, we're losing Mikey. We're losing. Oh, wait for Mikey. And I'd be dragging about 100 feet behind because I don't know. I was looking at everything but where I was going. And uh, she'd worry so much. And Grandma would drive a straight beeline like, Let him fall. If he gets lost, he's lost. A lot of love, Grandma. Everybody loved Grandma Katie. If you had a problem, go see her, she'll take care of you. Saw a button on, zip her barn door, all kind of good stuff. She was there, make pajamas, making uh, those, uh, what do you call those? Afghans? Afghans. Afghans. Yeah. You get a baby, you get a Afghan. Grandma was a person of principle, hard worker. I called her one day, I was at my office in East Detroit, and I went over to Aunt Vincy's who lived right nearby. They lived together then, and here she was on a ladder about the top rung, almost trimming the tree with a hedge trimmer. And I nearly had a heart attack, I said, come down from there, I'll do that thing. You need anything done around here, I'll do it. During the winter, one time she calls me up and tells, Mike, can you come over, uh, get my uh, snow blower started. I gotta do the snow, the driveway and the whole thing. I said, okay, I went over there, I grabbed the snow blower and I give it a pull, a couple of three pulls or four to start it up, she grabbed the thing by the handle and she said, oh wait, and she dove into doing the snow uh, shoveling with that snow blower and it was her job. You weren't taking it away from her. Oh gosh, she was the caretaker of it. And Vincy just owned the house and Grandma Katie lived there. And she said, well, I'll do the painting. She painted, she did the carpeting. She was outside doing the garden. She raised all kind of tomatoes and flowers, and she was happy that the two of them lived together in harmony. And Aunt Vincy could only drive, but she had to be told where to go. And Grandma Katie knew everywhere, and she just tell her, turn right here, turn left there. Okay, we gotta go to the bank. Okay, then we gotta go to the post office. And Aunt Brooke, uh, Vincy would just keep driving around, and, and Ma had everything in order. She was cleaning the leaves out of the gutter on the ladder one time. I said, Ma, what are you doing up there? <laughs> she said, I'm cleaning the gutters. Then when Johnny sold the house, he says, Ma, I'm going to build a house and I'll build a four-room bedroom. I says, no, you built a house for your family. I'm going to go live with my sister. And I moved with my sister. And I lived with her. 25 years I lived yeah. with her, yeah, till she died. I caught her trimming the front hedge with an electric trimmer, and sudden, <laughs> and Vincy would do nothing like this. She was in her pajamas in the house, watching some love story. I told her, you watch all that sexy stuff? She said, I said, they're, they're making out. She said, oh no, they aren't. They're, they're all dressed, they're just under the covers. I said, I don't know, looks like porn to me, Aunt Vincy. The place was like the church. Yeah. She had more, uh, Holiness and uh, uh, religion in that house, if them walls can talk, always yeah. had homemade lemonade cookies always there yeah. in case you could company. And uh, clean, there were old parts, but they were all clean, you know, the floor. And yeah. she was fast. That's where Roseanne and Kathy got their spirit of cleaning. Yeah. You go to their houses, man. There's spotless. Grandma lived to be 94. But we learned a lot of strong work principles from Grandma, and we learned to be truthful and honest and, and do things in a right way and uh, have faith and confidence in yourself. Uh, Grandpa Vito died in 1942, and Grandma never remarried. She wanted to keep her family together, and she was the rock in this family. She, it was through her that we did the togetherness and we always kept together. And uh, her daughter, daughters-in-law were like her own girls. She treated them the same as Aunt Mary, no different. She was a, a loving, strong, sometimes hard woman, but she was good. She was good for us. We needed somebody like a rock like her. I was born on Arndt Street and I moved to uh, Gloucester. Mm -hmm. and my sister was born in Gloucester and we moved back and we moved on Preston. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and Mount Elliot. And from there, we moved to Zender and Ellery. We all still all lived together. When Grandma got married, Grandma Katie got married to my dad, they lived in that same house with them all, with all of them. Mike was just born when the same month that Grandpa Giovanni died, 1934, August. We all we always lived together. Me, my brothers, sisters. Mike was a baby. Uh, my Aunt Vincy lived there, and mm -hmm. my grandfather and grandmother lived there, and we had a border. We moved from Ellery to Elmwood and Hunt. Then we moved to the house that Mr. Stellino lived rented behind. My father's cousin, uh, Atzamagarila Asaro, and his brother Shiku. Mm -hmm. And they were living on Hunt and Ellery, but further down was near the corner. Atzamagarila moved to San Diego, so now her house was vacant. We just moved in there in the middle of the night, and just kept paying the rent. Mm -hmm. because. Housing was hard to get. You couldn't sure. get housing at that time, see? Mm -hmm. So we lived there about, uh, about a, six months a year, and along comes some produce guy that made money during the Depression and bought the house. So, so now we didn't have nowhere to go, so Mr. Stellino built his back room, and we lived in there. And Mr. Stellino blocked the windows in, mm. made two windows, and we had the back door. And mm -hmm. uh, we had a small yard with a big uh, half-ton garbage can made out of cement. <laughs> she had a unit behind the store, and uh, they just used it as a storage place. And she talked her husband into letting Grandma Katie and the three kids, or four kids, and Grandma, uh, Grandma Nono moved into that house. And then she would sneak us bread and a gallon of milk, a quart of milk, you know, and some lunch meat and stuff. There's a, there was a door between the store and the, this, this uh, area where she, she, we, we lived, you know. We had no uh, tub. We had two bedrooms that they were very small. And Aunt Mary and Grandma, they, they lived in one bedroom and then me, and uh, Uncle Mike, we lived in another bedroom with Grandma Nono. And then we saved the water and rinsed two kids out with the water. And then, you know, we had to throw it away when it got really, really bad. And then we started over, you know. Astellinos, behind a store. <laughs> Do you remember that house? Very well. We were lucky to have inside bathroom. Just the toilet. No tub. No tub, no wash. <laughs> no, no, what do you call it, sink? No, uh, cooking sink. stove, we had a sink. We what had a we cooking had? gas and we had a base burner for heat. All oh, those days, we survived it. It was hard times or not, we survived it. Now yeah. we're like, like we're rich now. Then we moved from there to Benson and Concord. Well, I stayed there for the 7th, 8th, 9th grade, 10th, 11th. I graduated from 12. We lived there for a while. I mean, we lived there from, um, from the time I was in 2nd grade until the time I was in um, 11th, 10th grade. And so then Uncle Chris says, why don't you move out there? He bought a two-family flat. And he had a two family, lived in a two family flat himself, so he had, he had two houses. And Grandma Katie helped him with all the real estate because she was the realtor of, the, of Uncle Mike, Uncle Chris, because he couldn't write. Mm -hmm. So she did all his deals and then she explained everything to Uncle Chris. And so he decided to uh, uh, make us live on Bewick. Mm -hmm. so that, we moved to Bewick then. So we were on Bewick and Mac. And we lived there for a year, and then we were paying twenty dollars rent on Benson's. So he said he'd never raise the rent on us. So we lived there about a year, and then uh, he raises the rent, raises the rent five or six dollars. And when he pulled that on us, my mother started looking for a house. I said, "Well, yeah, but you're gonna pay rent anywhere you go." She says, "I ain't paying rent." I said, 
just the way you need a down payment. He said, I got down payment. So she had only $500 she had saved in about a year and a half, which was good money because I was only making $30 a week. So then we looked at the house on field and we looked at that house and it was mean and needed paint. Mm -hmm. I mean, we painted four or five coats of paint on that darn thing, boy, and an old <laughs> garage upstairs and down and stuff. I miss him. My mama says, well, we could live here. It's a big house. She says, well, we have to do a lot of cleaning. And we did. When we first moved in there, we had to take wallpaper off all the rooms. All the rooms had double, triple layers of wallpaper. And then we had to paint, prime and paint all the rooms on the inside. Mm -hmm. And then we had to paint the outside of the house. So John and Frank, not Frank, John and I, and Grandma, the three of us, painted that whole big two-story house. I don't know how we did it. I don't know how we ever did it. But we, way at the top, there was a gable, right. way, way up at the peak, and, and Grandma wouldn't let me or John go up there. Either she wouldn't go either, so we, one of the neighbors uh, from down the street that we were friends with, she asked him if he would please come over. So it was only a piece about, you know, six, not even six feet wide, was high and then just up to a peak and so Jim Jim came over and he painted that for, for us. We worked in that house. We steamed every room that was papered and painted over. It took us months but everybody worked. Everybody had a job. Everybody put their work in there but when we were finished it was like a palace. And we lived there the longest in our life. White staircase, piano, and the telephone there. We lived comfortably there. Two story. The boys were in three boys in one room. Mary and I in the other bedroom, and Grandma had her own room. Alzheimer's Field was a beautiful castle. Grandma Katie loved that house. From day one when we bought it, it was upstairs three bedrooms, and downstairs there was a dining room and a kitchen. And then we had a full basement with the furnace, coal furnace, and we had all the tubes that went to all the rooms and heat up the whole house. And then we painted it, kept it up, uh, it was just beautiful. She found our house on field. There were two ladies uh, that were owned it together and they were selling it and she bought, my grandma bought it on a land contract and she gave them like, I don't know, $800 down and the rest uh, by, the, by the month. They did the contract and they had to go to an attorney or I don't know how they do. And they signed up all the papers and the two ladies, the sisters, they said, okay now, uh, Catherine, we need to take you out to celebrate. This is the first house you ever bought. So she said, okay, so they took her out to a restaurant. We went downtown to close the steel, and then they ordered a drink, and I came home and I was sicker than a dog. Was it whiskey? Yeah, it was something <laughs> for what me to get sick. Uh, I got sick all the way home. And they, and they ordered her a martini. So they ordered her a martini, so she starts sipping on the martini. Well, when they brought her home, poor thing, she couldn't even stand up. She was so plastered and so <laughs> out of it. I never she, heard that story. She went, she went to bed and she laid in bed for it, uh, the rest of the whole day and half of the next day it made her so sick. Poor thing, they she poisoned said, oh, I'm her. I'm not drinking anything else. No more, I don't care. I'm not drinking nothing, nothing. So when you say martini to her, she always says, oh, I don't want it. We made a remarkable house out of that house on field and we stayed there over the rest of the time. I, I do have good memories of that house. Uh, I think uh, we were all in a place that we were financially better. Uh, Grandma was working steady, I was working, Frank was married, and Kathy was born, and those were all great memories of Kathy when she was born. That was like, here comes the next generation, and so we were all happy about that. I think we had a good time at the field house. We lived, we were our own boss, and we had our own yard. We did a lot of work in that house.
When you talk about our family, you're talking about a real tight-knit family. We have always celebrated things together as a family. You know, I think what was nice was that Grandma always had us at her house on Sundays a lot. So we all came home for dinner, when, even when we didn't live there. So it was a nice, it was a lot of, it was a lot of good memories there. Comfortable, it was a comfortable place. And uh, people came from the neighborhood and visited. It was like we used to say that was Grand Central Station. Neighbors and, you know, relatives um, would come in and visit on Sunday afternoon. And we always had something going on, something, uh, somebody's helping somebody and uh, uh, kisses all the time. Everybody's kissing. And uh, respect was uh, number one priority. George Arlington and I went to uh, the camp, free press camp. I was at the free press camp uh, counselor for a week, they asked, and I was home now. And see, George and I, we took a dollar 38 cents and a couple of blankets, and, uh, and we took a streetcar downtown, and then we took the streetcar to Royal Oak, and we took to Royal Oak, and, and uh, we stayed uh, a couple of days in. Uh, at the camp because they knew me and so George and I had accommodations <laughs> and uh, we came back because it was a, the last week of the camp and why I bring this up was because Aunt Vincy was staying with us right so I asked her uh, could I would I could I go to uh, Pontiac, you know, Silver Lake and uh, spend the rest of the week there because they want me to uh, help them take down the camp, <laughs> George and I. He says, how are you going to get there? So I says, oh, I know the way. We're, we're, we're going to take a streetcar. She says, and they says, well, would your mother let you go? I says, oh, well, I certainly she would let me go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So she let me go. And Bob never knew anything about it. I don't even think he even told her. <laughs> so we were gone. And the first time I ever was away from home without my mother knowing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There was a woman in the neighborhood, and she wore she always wore black or not. And she was really, I always didn't like it. She was creepy, and she was always like lurking around our house. And everything. <laughs> but she was my grandmother said it was she was a friend. That was right around the time when I developed this uh, uh, ailment uh, from the trauma. But but one day then my grandmother, that lady was giving me a piece of fruit or something, and my grandma said, No no no, don't eat that, don't eat that. So then she went to the woman and she said to her, you stay away from here, you stay away from my granddaughter. You're giving her a bad curse. Get away, get away. It was probably anxiety, nervous, nervous, and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, all that stuff. So, But luckily Grandma Katie found a good doctor and took me to this doctor, this one woman who had, who was religious. So she was, she was a religious person and she was, you know, trying to get the evil spirits away from me. And she had a, a, a child, a, a neighbor that lived downstairs from her, and he was a seer. And he's the one that told, that's right, he's the one that told the, the healing healer lady that there was somebody trying to do me harm. She had done that all the time, you know, like when, when John, my brother John used to get a lot of stomach aches. And whenever he had a stomach ache and it wouldn't go away, she would take him to Ronavida the healer lady, and she would pray over him and you know, rub on him, rub his, his belly and pray over him and light candles and everything and pray over him and go and then he would get, he would be better. I think she was a neighbor from when they lived in, in the more inner city in that okay. neighborhood and that's how Grandma Nono found her or knew of her. So when we moved up to Benson it was like a six or eight block long to go to her house. Whoever, else, whoever had an ailment, she'd take it to her and, and she'd pray over him and everything. She had a big, big statue of the Blessed Mother that was bigger than life size in her, in her parlor. It was beautiful, it was beautiful. But she was very religious, that lady. Mm -hmm. And so there was the power of prayer kind of comes into our, uh, into our early life, you know, mm -hmm. even now. Yeah. yeah. We all went to Barry. It was right across the street. And um, we had, uh, we never had a Christmas tree till uh, Frank was like 15, 16, and I was like 12, or Aunt Mary and Uncle Mike, and Grandma, of course, Grandma Nono. And uh, 
We, we got a free Christmas tree one year, it was amazing. And when uh, we got it from Mrs. Tallinn, because she kept an eye on you know, our family and helped us out. She owned a grocery store, and her husband was well to do a good job at the market there. And uh, well, that was the first year we had a tree. And then we seemed to be getting another tree every year. It started there, and, uh, and we were real happy with that. We had a big pot belly stove and, uh, for heat. And uh, we didn't know the difference being poverty or, but we thought that was the normal thing, the norm. And then uh, we, we still were, we still had a lot of fun when we were kids, everybody. And everybody got along and it was, it was, it was amazing. We used to go to Belle Isle as children and stay there overnight from Saturday and Sunday Mr. and Mrs. Stalina, who owned a grocery store, uh, used, used to bring all the food, and, and uh, Mrs. Stalina was a bit ill, so she was going there to rest and recuperation and have companionship with Grandma Katie. And with all these beautiful times there, we used to go there in a little Model A, all us kids plus the three Stalino kids plus Grandma Nono. And uh, we'd pack up in that little old Model A and put two chunks of ice on the back bumper and pop and everything and go there and have a wonderful time. And as my children were very small, uh, I took them to Belle Isle so they could appreciate what I had used in my childhood as a place of fun and enjoyment. Our particular favorite spot was on the Canadian side right next to the Coast Guard station which had a beautiful beach with uh, ropes roping off the area and it was well used two big old uh, droopy trees were there, which are still there today. Big fat old things. And uh, we all went to there on January the 1st for a couple of years, we would all go to Belle Isle to skate. And Uncle John Block would make his famous chili, a big tub of chili actually, and we would clean that whole thing up as well. Grandma Katie would come along and she would bring pizza enough pizza for all of us. And we enjoyed full days there in, in the cold of winter, zero weather, and sometimes it's less than that. But we went, we ate hearty, played hearty, had a wonderful time. Yeah, we did that every year. Everybody had ice skates from the, got some from this one, hand-me-downs, uh, and we used to go to bed. It used to make, Grandma Kay used to make a big pot of chili sauce because we were freezing in a lot of times. And, uh, but everybody was not fed. Everybody was skating and uh, Aunt Mary and, uh, and Ma, you know, Meta. And uh, she was, uh, she, but I couldn't believe it, but she, was, she got out of them skating. She was whirling around like a Sony. My mother was, uh, was bottling liquor in Saginaw a little while there while she was pregnant. And then something happened in Saginaw, and uh, the bottling business went out of business, mm -hmm. and uh, you escaped to Detroit. Mom tried to earn as much as she could on her own, you know, working uh, for other people, um, and uh, wherever she could get day work, she would work. So she was gone out of the ho home a lot. So my mm -hmm. grandmother was kind of the most influential, mm -hmm. the most influential. Mm -hmm influence on us. Um. He got me the job at the barber shop. He's quite a guy, Mr. Gillard. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're making $15 on a Saturday, wow. shining shoes. Wow. And Mike and John and uh, were selling papers. Mm -hmm. I had gotten them the corner at, uh, that I used to have, and uh, they were selling by the theater, Sunday papers. Mm -hmm. The boys worked, so I was home doing the household stuff. My brothers worked, um, my brother, Mike and John and Frank, all of them worked at a very early age as kids. They worked with a blind man in our neighborhood. Uh -huh. And he had a wagon, a big wagon, and he had brooms and mops and brushes and all kinds of household cleaning stuff. And mostly brooms and brooms though. So Mike and John would go with him and they'd go up in the neighborhood like the fuller brush people used to do up and down the street selling. I got a job that I was doing 
I was always working, making just nickels, dimes, you know, dollars. I was working for uh, this Manzelman broom factory. Me and Mike, we used to take this guy who was blind, and we used to take him down the street. I told, he asked, tell me what street you want to cover today, and he did. He had things marked down. So we'd walk from the, from that's right near our home where the factory was, and we walked to like St. Jean sometime and then walk it all the way back on a Saturday for like maybe a buck and a half, a buck and a quarter. And it was something though, and grandma could stretch a dollar into two dollars. And they go to each house, I have to laugh, they used to go to each house, each one of them, Mike must have been no more than eight or seven or eight or nine, and John maybe 10, because they're not that far back, or even younger maybe. And they go up to the house and knock on each, one, each door and say, do you want to buy a broom? <laughs> do you want to buy a broom? I think a lot of people bought the brooms because they couldn't say no to these little guys. At the end of the day, he would give them some money, and I don't know, if I, probably wasn't much, you know. And they turned all that money into mom. Then later on, uh, John sold papers, and Mike, Mike sold papers, not much. And then, and Frank was always peddling papers from when he was a young teenager. So all that money went into help support our family. We always had money to fall back on, mm -hmm. but she never told us except when we moved with Uncle Chris. That's the only time she ever mentioned that when she had money. Uh -huh. She never mentioned any other time. Well, yeah, we can get a wagon for you. We can get a bike. Yeah, we got fifty dollars. I don't get. We can get a bike. It was nothing other like that. Mm -hmm. We never had a bike. <laughs> we had a bike till. Mike and John balling for the paper route. Grandma Nona was my favorite. She would raise us, and Grandma Katie would go to work. Right? She worked at Henry Cleaners for a long time. She was a teller at a little market on uh, Van Dyke, and she was uh, a cashier, you know. Yeah. And she'd walk home and stuff like that. And then everybody would get organized, and she'd start cooking feed all the kids, four kids, and grandma, herself. And uh, we made do with uh, what we had, and uh, we were always happy kids. She made us happy. Actually, I have a whole big bedspread that grandma Nono crocheted for me that I still got. It's like an heirloom. And she took care of the house when everybody was gone working or playing or doing whatever they're doing. She kept an eye on that house and she didn't let nobody near it. She was happy I was getting married and, you know, she had the trousseau all displayed in the dining room and that was what you did then, so, yeah, she was real happy about it and very proud that, you know, her daughter got married the right way. <laughs> her family tree she had right here. She knew whose brother married, whose sister, whose uncle and the cousin moved over and the baby came and then they moved to Chicago with all that. She knows everything. My dad married my mom, Shirley Schultz, in 1947 and us five children were born. Myself, I'm the oldest, Frankie, Lynn, Vicki, and Dino. They were only 21 years old when they got married and Grandma Katie was only 37. Can you imagine being a grandmother at 37 years old? Aunt Mary, Mary married John Block. He was a police officer. She married him in 1953, and they had three children, Matthew, uh, Jane, and Tony. Uncle Mike kind of went out of order. He, got, he married Teresa Enderly in 1957 in a little church up in the Thumb, St. Agatha's in Gagetown. And they had four children, Susan, Linda, Michael Vito, and Mary Beth. Then Uncle John married Aunt Nancy in 1958, and they had three children in as many years, um, Kathy, Roseanne, and John Vito. There were 15 grandchildren in 13 years. I am the oldest, Mary Beth is the youngest. We gave Grandma a brooch with all her 15 great-grandchildren, -grand the birthstone for each of them. And eventually, all the grandchildren found their soulmates, got married, and had great-grandchildren. And Grandma, I think Uncle John, it was, alluded to the fact that she knew all their names, all their birth dates, everything about them. And we gave her an apron that had 
31 names on it. She got to go to the wedding of uh, one of her great-grandchildren with Aunt Mary and Grandma. And she looked beautiful and it was just uh, a couple years before she passed. We lost her on March 4th, 2005. She was just had just turned 94. And so we continue the legacy of her love and what she inspired on us and hard work. And uh, she was just, family was everything to her. She was so proud. And I could still see her many times when we had these occasions, she would put her arms out and say, I started all this. This is all because of me. <laughs> so that was, uh, that was Grandma Katie. When we first got married, we lived in an apartment. Um, Near, right near about oh, two or three miles from Grandma's house. And uh, so we lived there until I got pregnant. Then we moved back in with Grandma. We moved in to the house on field with, and lived with Grandma Katie. So she said, you go to work, I'll watch, the, I'll watch Matt, the baby, Matthew, and you save all your money so you can buy your own house. And so, okay. Grandma Katie always Always had, we always had good stuff. We had spadini, which uh, was made out of veal, which was a delicacy. Sometimes we'd have pork chops, but we always had a veal mm -hmm. on good days, mm -hmm. spadinis, and most of it was hamburger. She made an Italian sausage, like you know. Mm -hmm. She made uh, bread, she mm -hmm. baked bread, she made pizza. Homemade pizza, not the stuff you get in the, in the pizza parlor. This is real Sicilian pizza from scratch, thick like that not thin, and loaded, and done the real Sicilian style. She made all the cookies for Christmas and stuff. She was a specialist of spaghetti. Spaghetti with laghi, spaghetti with cucuzzi, spaghetti with pizzetti, pisci, brodo, St. Joseph, pasta cuzugo. Then she made meatballs, she made polpetti, beautiful. Grandma was always cooking and hustling around the place. She measured, never measured much at all. You gotta put a teaspoon and she'd just go, teaspoon, well, uh, saucer, put it in there, put it in there, whatever it is. She'd like, my measure it, you just gotta come out. Don't worry, it'll come out. Sit down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she had more, more gondolas, that's all, all kind of creamy, and pies, cakes, cookies, telly cookies, biscotti. I mean, she made everything and she always had a dish or two ready for when company comes. We gotta have this uh, always something. And if they come during lunch, dinner, like on a Sunday, they always be over for dinner and spend the whole day over. She made everything. She uh, never had. She had always had food for the company. Always had something ready. I don't know where she got it, but she always had something ready. Yes. Coffee or cookies or something left over. But she made do with what she had. But no matter who came over, she was always a, always had something. We had it good. She made speed juni. She made tripa. She made octopus. She made uh, uh, you name it. She made it. It, was, it. She had no. She never never backed down on anything or anybody, man or beast. <laughs> she, she was tough. She, she was everything in one person. She was the most attractive lady in the world. Luckily for her love, we all walked a straight line and we stayed out of trouble. We had one, one big family reunion at, uh, I think we started with Aunt Mary's. She had a pool about 30 feet across and a little backyard and we all crammed in there and jumped in the pool and spent the whole day there and we barbecued and drank and had fun and commiserated and just wonderful. The kids were quite small at that time. And from there, we went then to, uh, from my, at my house at, on Eiffel in Warren, where Aunt Teresa and I lived since 1961. And we had a smaller pool, 15 feet across, but we used the beans out of that pool. And uh, every everybody came and we set up two grills and uh, Uncle John and I did all the barbecuing and Aunt Rosie and Aunt Vincy and Grandma were there together with us all. <clears throat> then we did that for a number of years and then a few times too we went over to Uncle John's and he had this big pool in his little teeny backyard like a postage stamp. Didn't matter. We ate there and we cooked and we eat. After a time 
<clears throat> Richard and Kathy were very gracious in saying, you come out to our place at the lake. So this was uh, this was the big tradition. We went to the to Richard and Kathy's and they had this little bitty house at first and then gradually the house grew and grew and it was twice the size as when they first moved there. And we would have this big huge deck where we could put 20, 30 people on that deck and we would all be there and, the, and the, we'd cook and have a contest and, and see who last, last year's winners were, this year's and so forth, that we'd do boating and water skiing and everything. It's usually the middle of August when we do this thing. Catanias do one thing, they eat a lot and they cook a lot. And they always make special dishes and things like that. Everybody would bring something and we'd have a little contest as to who had the best things and they had different categories and all of uh, food like uh, desserts and, and baked goods and uh, spaghetti or whatever. The dishes are, are getting becoming more and more exotic <laughs> as as now the grandchildren are even making dishes of their own and uh, they compete in the contest and they win too so the children are a part of this thing too it's not just the adults getting together to talk the children are very much involved in this thing and we brought them up that way so we could tie this thing together and then the come with great grandchildren when they come we'll introduce them to this this great uh, celebration that we enjoy as the Catania family. It means everything to everybody. I have people were already asking at the beginning of the year, you know, when's the cook-off, when's the reunion, which uh, it evolved from a reunion where I just, when we hosted, say bring a dish to pass and everybody would bring these fabulous dishes and so then I said we should make this a cook-off so the one year in 1987 we did and then it grew to seven categories and then we had a junior category for the children uh, and there, everybody got involved with that and um, uh, Christmas Eve was the same thing so basically it's our two things and we just don't want it to ever stop. Today we still get together and we will until time's end but uh, we pass that on to you and hope you will keep it together with your children. The strong thing in our family is the love for each other. We have such intense love for each other. We, ha we, we have never come to a point where we're not talking to each other. We always talk to each other. Even if we have a disagreement, we're talking loud too. We always talk loud. That was the whole thing. Getting together. Well, you get together, we Catanias, we eat. Eating, we're getting together. Zeti, uh, Pichi, Brodo, St. Joseph, Bicycle Zugu, then she made meatballs, she made food pepti, beautiful, gondola, that's all, all kind of creamy, and pies, cakes, cookies, terry cookies, biscotti. I mean, she made everything and she always had a dish or two ready for when company comes.